Okay, let's continue with part two of customer insights and information management within. So we're talking about collecting our own information within the organization, essentially using marketing research for that purpose. And this table outlines uh, what the marketing research process is going to be within the organization. Okay. And the first step is going to be the, based on the objectives and what it is that you're trying to achieve. You're going to pick or select your research approach. I'm going to talk about observation, survey, and experiment. And then after you have decided on the research approach, you're going to decide how you're going to contact the customers to gather the information. We're going to have multiple options. Not all of them are available for all the research uh, approaches, obviously. Okay. Then we're going to have to decide on who we're going to be asking. right? Who are we going to be observing? Who are we going to be contacting? Okay. And for the most part, we're not going to use the census in marketing unless you're in a business-to-business -business environment where you might only have three or four uh, companies uh, that you're dealing with. In a situation like that, you could do a census. When you're talking about business-to-consumer uh, marketing, uh, you're going to obviously select a sample, okay, because you cannot ask everybody. Okay, and we're going to talk about some of the technical aspects that come with sampling. And finally, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to decide on how we're going to gather that information from those people using those research approaches. And for that, we're going to have to design some sort of instrument. Instrument basically means how we're going to be able to collect the data. It's going to be our measurement tool. Okay, we're going to discuss this in some detail. So now I'm going to walk you through each of these different stages. Okay, so starting with um, the research approaches, uh, we're going to discuss a few of the different options that you have depending on what the goal uh, is that you're trying to achieve with this uh, marketing research study. Okay. Um, we're going to start with observation. Um, actually, observation is fascinating because um, oftentimes it's an approach that is discarded um, but I will argue that observation is very valuable because it enables you to gather information directly about behaviors of the actors that you're interested in. For the most part, in our case, it's going to be consumers, right? So observational research is very powerful in one way, which is that you directly observe behavior. Now, it does have downsides, obviously, and because there are certain behaviors that you're not going to be able to observe. For example, private behavior that happens within the household. Right, and um, I strongly will discourage you from trying to observe people through windows and stuff like that. Not only is it illegal, but unethical, and it can get you into a whole host of troubles. Right, so observation has its limitations, but it's very powerful because it directly enables you to gather information about actual behavior. Another downside of observation, obviously, is that it's not going to enable you to gather any information about things like feelings or attitudes that are embedded within the brain of the customer because of that if you want to gather information about that you're going to have to do something different other than observation ethnographic research is kind of a type of observational research and uh, that essentially uh, involves uh, getting the researcher in in a situation that will enable them to observe uh, customers, in our case, in their natural environments. So this might entail, for example, spending a life, uh, a day in the life of your customer, something like that, where you will actually go maybe into a household. And of course, you will have to recruit these people ahead of time. They will have to agree to conduct this research, and you might have to compensate them monetarily for them to give you access to the information, and in this case, their time. Right? And you might actually be literally shadowing somebody, just observing what they do, how they behave, how do they go about cleaning their clothes, right? It depends what kind of marketing research goal you have up front, right? So if you're trying to learn about specific behaviors, ethnographic research could be useful because it enables you to observe maybe some of those my private behaviors that I was talking about in, that in observational research typically you're not able to observe. Okay. And... Um, Similar downsides apply, right? Uh, which is that it doesn't enable you to uh, observe uh, things that cannot be observable per se, like, for example, attitudes. And there are other tools or research approaches that we're going to use for that uh, if we actually want that. Okay. 
And, and in particular, if we're interested in attitudes, uh, the number one uh, research approach in marketing is actually survey research, right? And the biggest upside of service research is that it enables you to capture those psychological uh, concepts that otherwise are not transparent when you observe behavior, right? The big upside of survey research is that it's very flexible, it enables you to gather information about all sorts of things, even behaviors, right? You can ask people about what it is that they do. Uh, you can also ask them about attitudes, preferences, etc., feelings, right? A lot of things that maybe are harder to tackle using observational research can be used, uh, can, can be gathered or information can be gathered using survey. Uh, I will argue the biggest downside of survey is that people lie and people misremember and people also rationalize post behavior. What do I mean by this? People do things like buy a particular item right, or buy a particular service and then after the fact they provide their own reasons on why they bought it, but those are not true reasons. Those are things that you make up afterwards to justify your purchase. So while survey research is very powerful, flexible, is the most widely used technique, it does have some downsides. Uh, Nothing is perfect and different tools are more appropriate for different uh, purposes. Okay. Then you have experimental research. Right? Experimental research, it's kind of unique because it enables the uh, researcher to manipulate the environment. What that means is that you make a certain change, right? For example, the change could be something subtle and small, like showing some of the consumers an ad or showing them, uh, like, for example, a trailer for a movie, right? And that's the experimental manipulation that you're using. And then you're trying to measure what kind of effects are triggered by that experimental manipulation. So the nice thing about experiments is that they enable you to answer questions of cause and effect. What you're trying to see what effect a certain marketing variable, for example, change has on people, right? And so, it's nice in that regard. The biggest downside of experiments is that they tend to be very expensive. And oftentimes they are conducted in labs, which makes them uh, have weak external validity. What this means is that whatever happens in the lab might not extend beyond the lab because people know that they are being observed. And because of that, they might behave, I don't know if I want to say uncomfortably, but it's slightly differently than they will in their real uh, situation. There are field experiments that will enable you to mitigate this, but the downside of a field experiment when you do an experiment uh, in the real life is that you might not be able to control for other things, which is what you want to do in the lab, right? You want to keep it clean, make sure that the only thing that is changing is the stimulus that you are providing uh, your participants, and this might not be possible in the field, okay? And then uh, we have another very popular uh, technique, which is a focus group. Now, a focus group is similar to an in-depth interview when you just have a conversation with somebody about topics, usually with open-ended questions. Open-ended questions are questions that are not yes, no, or, you know, uh, how old are you, right? Those are closed-ended questions that have a very simple solution. Open-ended questions will be, how do you feel about um, the riots that are happening right now, right? It's an open-ended question that it enables you to just uh, go in detail about your feelings, about different options. So there is an open-ended answer, right? Uh, there is no clear-cut one or the other uh, answer. Now, focus groups are going to use these sort of questions, open-ended questions, and they are going to go beyond what an uh, in-depth interview will do because instead of having only one person, you're going to have a, a group, a small group, uh, like you have in this slide. A typical group size will be 6 to 10. Um, and then what you're going to have is you're going to have a trained moderator, oftentimes a psychologist, a sociologist, somebody who has been uh, trained and hopefully experienced in handle uh, group dynamics, which is not an easy thing to do. And they're going to have a set of open-ended questions that they're going to be uh, asking and try to direct the conversation to make sure that A, everybody participates within the focus group. What you will find is you will find in typical group dynamics you will have you know one or two people that speak a lot and they cannot take over the group or at least they try to take over 
and there will be a few people, two, three, depends on the group, that really don't have much to say. They are very passive, right? They are maybe a little bit more, um, they are more um, close guarded. They don't wanna share their opinions, right? So because of that, it's the job of the trainer to make sure that you know they balance the discussion, that they provide sufficient airtime to all the parties, and that they basically hunt down the insights, right? So. When you start asking open-ended questions, people are going to tell you stories, you know, that relate to the question you are asking. The follow-up questions that you ask right after that, the quality of those questions is going to really uh, make a difference between uh, getting a lot out of a focus group and not getting that much out of it. Uh, so, you know, focus groups are challenging in the sense that they require this trained moderator that hopefully has lots of experience, the quality of the insights are going to be a function of how good this person is. Uh, other downsides, and uh, they tend to be expensive because you're gathering a lot of data in one sitting, right? So you're gathering insights from multiple people at the same time, and you have to hire this trained person. You usually have to compensate the people that come because it's an experience, an ordeal that usually takes about an hour. Um, and the biggest downside is that whatever conversation happens within the group focus group, it's mostly exploratory in the sense that it's very hard to generalize any insights from the group to the population. Okay, so because of that, this is this is a great place to start. Uh, people tend to misuse focus groups and what they do is instead of running one or two focus groups and see what's going on and then using some more quantitative technique like a survey to try to validate those insights, what they will do is they will just run many focus groups, maybe 10, 15 of them, and thinking that because they have already uh, processed, let's say, 100 or 200 people using focus groups that they can just take the insights and generalize to the population. And honestly, that's not true. By the way, focus groups are uh, used heavily, for example, in politics. Um, yeah, so it's a tool that it can be used for marketing or other purposes. Good. Uh, now, when it comes down to uh, gathering information, the big change in the last 30 years is the online environment that enables you to essentially uh, conduct many of these different approaches, some of which you know, will work very similarly. You can do an interview using Zoom. You can do a focus groups also using Zoom. Uh, and it enables you to, you know, uh, do so uh, usually cheaper. You don't have to have people uh, go back and forth from their place or from their job side to to the center where the focus group or the interview is it's, um, being administered, right? Um, also enables you to the surveys, right? The biggest uh, type of tool that is used online in my experience is survey. Um, and that can be done pretty efficiently. Um, now, originally, <laughs> and this was originally, uh, the response rates online were quite a bit higher than offline. I think it's because of the convenience, right? Plus it was kind of a new thing. And so people didn't know exactly what to do with it. But those response rates have been dropping uh, over time. And now they are not that much different from um, other methods instead of just online. Um, and of course, if you can do some special targeting, like for example, uh, Facebook enables you to do, you can do very uh, careful targeting of customers using Facebook's capabilities it will enable you to reach groups that are hard to reach otherwise. So if you're trying to go for a very specific, very unique demographic, uh, or maybe psychographic profile usually, uh, the nice thing about online is they will enable you to reach those customers uh, way, way better than traditional uh, marketing research. Now, when it comes down to the Marketing research plan, the next step after we have decided on the method that we're going to use is going to be sampling, right? Who are we going to ask? And who are we going to ask? Uh, it's a difficult question, right? So sampling is something, it's a subset of statistics. And it usually requires uh, lots of studying before you can actually do a reasonable job in sampling. There are some guidelines that you can actually follow. 
but uh, you're going to have to make some selections in terms of your different options for sampling. Now, first, let's talk about why sampling is necessary. Sampling is necessary because reaching everybody in the population is usually not an option, unless you're dealing with business to business, where you might only be reaching a few firms. Um, and then, you know, you can do a census. A census is when you ask everybody in the population. A sample is when you only ask a percentage of the total population. Okay. Um, think about cooking, right? I like to cook. So if you're making some soup and you want to know whether the soup is good or not, instead of eating the whole pot of soup, right, which will be a census, what you do is you take a spoon, hopefully a clean spoon, right, and you sample, right? Uh, but if you're going to sample, if you're a smart cook, you know that it's not the same to just sample from the top or to stir the pot first and then sample, right? So there is going to be different ways of gathering information in terms of sampling that is going to enable us to get a more accurate depiction of how good the soup is, right? And if you stir the pot, what you're going to get is going to be more representative. So we're going to be talking about a few different techniques that you can use in sampling to make sure that A, your sample is more representative, and B, that you're more efficient. So you can learn more with... Uh, less less of a sample so less budget less money so we're going to talk about first different types of sampling techniques so the most um, appealing in my experience from a student perspective is simple random sampling because this one makes the most sense right uh, and the idea in simple random sampling is that everybody in the population has the same chance of being chosen right and that, I think it's appealing because it's simple, right? Everybody's like, you know. Uh, now, the nice thing about using simple random sampling is because it's a probability sample, you're going to be able to generalize whatever learning we do from the sample to the population, which is really what we're trying to learn about. We don't care about the sample, we care about the population. The sample is a tool to learn about the population, right? So simple random sampling. Now, what is the downside of simple random sampling is that there are more efficient ways of gathering information that will enable you to basically get more accurate picture for the same budget or uh, get a smaller budget and the same level of accuracy, right? And those are the two that you have right here or a combination of them, okay? Which are stratified sampling, right? And stratified sampling is when you basically, a priori, you divide the population into groups. Now, the technical aspect is the groups within, uh, the groups that you're creating need to be more similar within group than they are across groups for this to function. But the book doesn't explain it. Uh, so you create groups, for example, a typical um, stratified sampling uh, group uh, assignment could be gender right so you have two genders male and female if you suspect that males are more similar to other males when it comes down to whatever you're studying let's say that you're studying attitudes about i don't know some sport right if you think that males tend to be more similar in their attitudes than males versus females uh, then sampling uh, using um, stratified sampling uh, with gender as a strata will actually make sense and what it enables you to do, and I can show it to you guys with numbers if you want to uh, have an individual conversation, but it takes about an hour, maybe 30 minutes to do so. You can show that what you can do with the stratified sampling is you can get a more accurate information for the same number of uh, respondents for the same sample size. So it is basically a way of improving your efficiency which is nice, right? So it enables you for the same amount of money to get more accuracy, or like I said before, uh, for less amount of money, the same level of accuracy that you were getting with simple random sample, okay? Then we have cluster sample. Actually cluster sample, you can think about it as a special case of stratified sample, where instead of using other characteristics, you use distance, right? So you can use something like a zip code for example, for cluster sampling. So people within the same uh, zip code will be uh, sampled from uh, 
and then what you do is within that zip code you do a simple random sampling and just the fact that you're sampling from the zip codes will actually improve your efficiency and this is not obvious right but with a numerical example you you could see it it's just it's time consuming so if you want to know more about this let me know i'll be happy to walk you through a few examples if you're interested otherwise this is more something that you will do in a marketing research class which this is just an intro right and then other than probability sample we have non-probability sample and you'll be like professor but what will you do non-probability sample if you can do probability sample which it has the nice feature that it enables you to generalize to the population well the reason why you do non-probability sample is because it's cheaper and more convenient to do that's it so you can get your data faster and you spend less money the downside of non-probability samples is that whatever results you get out of the sample are not uh, in any way uh, easily generalized to the population so the results you get are about the sample and you don't have the mathematics that enable you to take that data and say ah, this applies to the population this way and so the downside of non-probability sample is that you cannot generalize to the population the upside is cheaper more convenient faster right you have a few different techniques you can use the first one is convenience sample this is just ask uh, people that are convenient to you so for example you can ask your friends on facebook right when you post a little uh, survey to your facebook friends right and that would be a convenient sample and the reason why is because not everybody has the same chance of being chosen in any way right um, so in a situation like that you don't know how to generalize to the population whatever population you're interested in right but the nice thing is you can get answers pretty quickly right and judgment sample this is when you have some insight as an expert that enables you to ask people that you think uh, are interested in some way for example super users or somebody who does a lot of something right so if you're i don't know if you're a gamer right and you want to gather information uh, about you know video game usage if you ask a gamer the kind of insights you're going to get for example in an in-depth interview are going to be a lot more detailed and colorful than if you ask a casual gamer that maybe doesn't know anything about anything and they just can just tell you only a few things but they really don't have a clear picture about what's going on and what can be improved etc etc so judgment sample is when you select using your a priori knowledge some subgroup or people within the population that you think are going to be more um they're going to be able to provide you more insights now again you cannot generalize what a gamer will tell you to the total population because casual gamers probably are going to behave very differently than a more hardcore gamers right and then the last part is quota sampling and quota sampling is where you try to match what you know some characteristic that you know about the population to the sample typical example of that will be gender again so if you go to the census and um, you can go to the website census.gov and you'll be able to gather information down to the zip code of information about demographics for example so you can look at gender breakdown for the richmond area and if you do that and now you're getting a sample from richmond let's say that in your sample you have 30 percent females and 70 percent males but when you go to the census you realize that within the richmond area the breakdown should be 51 49 right so you're really off from that okay so now what you can do is you can do quota sampling which essentially will force uh, those percentages to be the same as the ones you know to be true in the population okay and how will you do that uh, literally having a screening question at the beginning right so if you are doing telephone interview you'll call somebody you say can i speak with a female in the household why because you have too few females you want to get closer to 51 49 right so and if the answer is no there's no female in the household then you just hang up and dial the next number right so what you're doing is you're establishing a quota and that is based on some uh, characteristic that you already know a priori about the population and based on that you're just selecting uh, people and you either ask them or not depending on whether they fit the quota now obviously again this is not probability sampling and because of that you cannot generalize to the population by the way quick note in reality most uh, market research firms will use a combination of stratified sampling cluster sampling and quota sampling they do kind of a mixture approach uh, in my experience and 
So when you're commissioning an expensive market research study, in my experience, market research firms do a combination of these three in some sort of weird hybrid. And I'm not sure technically that they can generalize to the population, but they do it anyway. And good. Now that we know who we are asking and what it is that we're doing, are we doing an experiment, are we doing a survey, right? What you need to do is you need to create the instruments that you're going to use to measure the qualities or quantities that you are interested in. What do I mean by this? Well, if you're trying to measure the length of a piece of lumber at Home Depot, for example, you will carry your measuring tape, right? And everybody knows what a measuring tape is, so there's no question about that. But what if you want to learn about the attitude towards a particular brand that people have? How are you going to measure that? Is there a measuring tool that you can use for that? You're going to have to create your own. Usually, uh, if it's a questionnaire, you're going to have to ask specific questions that enable you to tap into that particular construct or concept that you're interested in. Right? So you're going to have to write questions. By the way, writing good questions is very tough. This is something that requires training and lots of experience to do well, of course. You can always write questions. Doesn't mean they're going to be good. Right? Um, good. So like I said, questionnaires are the most commonly used tool. You can also use other tools for measuring things. We're going to talk about some of those tools in the next slide. Okay. Uh, if you're doing a questionnaire, you might be able to do it using different forms of contact. It can be in person, over the phone, or online. We've already talked about online. Uh, phone gives you some flexibility. And in my experience, you get more quality data than from online. And in person, you even get higher quality data because people can tell you when a question is not clear, etc. If you're doing a questionnaire online, people just answer and not give you a lot of feedback. Um, so usually the quality of the answers, it increases. The highest is in person, and then phone, and then finally online. The quality of the data tends to be a little bit weaker. Uh, it's also cheaper though and you get it faster so there is upsides and downsides to both okay the nice thing about questionnaires like i've mentioned in service in general is that you know it's very flexible you can use it to measure different things all the way from behaviors preferences to attitudes there are two very distinct types of questions i've already alluded to this but you have close-ended and open-ended questions. Uh, close-ended questions are questions where you only have a few options to choose from Okay, typical question will be, what is your gender? And you have male or female. That will be a close-ended question. Another close-ended question that is used a lot is called a Likert scale. Likert, spelled like this. Sorry, my handwriting is really poor, especially when I'm just using my tactile screen for that. Not exactly the best. Likert. Now, Likert scale is when you make a statement, like for example, I love this brand. And then you give me options one, strongly agree, two, somewhat agree, three, uh, neutral, four, somewhat disagree, and five, strongly disagree. So you have five choices. By the way, it doesn't have to be five. It could be three, it could be 15, right? But you have a set number of choices that you have, and you're trying to tell me whether you agree or disagree with the statement. Likert scales are used very heavily in surveys because they are very flexible. You can write almost any statement and so on as well written and then give options to people as to whether they agree or disagree with it okay those will be close-ended questions the nice thing about close-ended questions is that they are quantitative by nature so you're going to be able to quantify things so easily the downside is that it doesn't give a lot of leeway for the respondent to give you feedback or information that goes beyond what the question originally is asking on the other hand, you have open-ended questions, right? How do you feel about brand X, whatever brand it is, right? And then you can talk about all sorts of things, right? You can talk about the products. You can talk about the brand itself, what people are saying, what your peers think about the brand, past experiences you have had. You can really go on and on and on, and there is so much information that you could gather in an open-ended question. The problem with open-ended questions is that they are hard to code. Right? How do you quantify the information in text? There are techniques and tools you can use for that, for example, content analysis. Um, but it's more challenging and it requires additional expertise. We might talk about that at some point, and if we don't, there is different resources, and if you're interested, let me know. I'll be happy to um, give you some pointers and, and give you more information if you need it. 
okay and like i said before different types of questions are going to be useful for different purposes right if you're doing exploratory research you're going to want to do for example open-ended questions right you still don't know what's wrong so you might as well go broad on the other hand if you have nailed down the problem already and you know exactly what it is that you're trying to measure close-ended questions are probably going to be more useful so it really depends on the purpose of the study you're going to lean more towards one or the other Doing both is okay, but it's more expensive and people get tired of answering information. So you really want to favor the ones that are more useful for the task that you have at hand. Now, other than uh, questionnaires and questions in general, for example, focus groups will use open-ended questions too, even though they are not a questionnaire. Uh, we have other tools that can be used to measure things that are useful in marketing. And this comes down a lot to technology right now. So we have things like people meters, right? When you walk into some stores, you have probably noticed that they have this cell that essentially counts the number of people that get in or come out of the store. That's useful to know if you want to know things like store traffic, which is something that could actually explain why your sales are up or down, right? So it might be that people are buying a lot of things at the store, but a few people are coming in the store, right? So the problem that you need to tackle is different depending on whether people are buying a lot, but few people come, or if a lot of people are coming, but few people are buying things, right? So people meters are useful to, for example, uh, measure um, yeah, track what people are actually doing in terms of coming and going. This can also be used for things like traffic. So if you're trying to plan, so this could be on marketing, right? If you're trying to plan whether you should put a new light in an intersection, right, when you have stop signs. Well, they put some strips in the road that measures the number of cars and the speed at which they actually go by. And based on that, they can make judgment calls about whether a, a new street light is needed, like, you know, traffic light versus just stop signs, for example. Okay, uh, you also have checkout scanners. These are now everywhere, right? So whatever you go to a store for the most part, right? You're gonna have a, a machine that uses um, a UPC reader that reads the code uh, of a package, like that barcode that uniquely identifies that product. And what this enables you to do is to gather a lot of information about a lot of things, right? So you know exactly things like your inventory because you know how many products you have before and how many you've sold because every time you sell something, it just gets recorded by the computer. Uh, if you're smart and you can leak this checkout um, data where you're going to have price and quantity and specific uh, product information. If you can link this to other things, like for example, demographics of the person that is actually answer, uh, sorry, buying the products by maybe having, I don't know, a rewards card that a lot of companies like Albertsons or Publix will, for example, have. Uh, and every time you scan the car, you know who's buying it, and you also know exactly what it is that they are buying and at what price. There's a lot of information that you can gather from this, right? Especially about behavior. This is directly behavior. You don't know why they are buying, but you know exactly what it is that they are buying and at what prices, right? Also, you can link this to your advertising if you're doing any advertising or any promotional stuff. You might know. You will also record here whether they have a coupon or not, blah, 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 blah. So there's a lot of information that is going to be stored in databases within the firm using these checkout scanners. And then what's now on the forefront, I will argue, in terms of marketing is a little bit more advanced, is this idea of neuromarketing, where what you're doing is you are using sensors on people to try to identify what kind of um, not only psychological reactions, but also physiological reactions you can actually find. So you can, for example, measure, you know, changes in the temperature, the amount of sweat, you know, that people are um, having because of their experience. If you are watching a movie, for example, what scenes are triggering their heart rate to go up. You can also measure the pupil dilation uh, because there is plenty of evidence that show that when you dilate your pupils, it's because you are having a certain type of reaction, right? Or the same thing when they're getting wider. The same thing, you can pe put people into an fMRI that looks at the uh, brain uh, brain blood flow at the different areas and try to understand how people are reacting to things like commercials etc of course as you can imagine some of these techniques are quite invasive right so they require you for example to get into a machine that makes all sort of noises and because of that i will argue that whatever you get out of them may actually be a little bit less accurate 
than what a lot of people claim, but it's really cool nonetheless. And the, the field starting to use this data, it's very, very expensive. I have a colleague in Cincinnati who is actually working on data like this, and, and he claims that the results are very interesting. I don't know. And I haven't looked at the data yet. I'm more of a data person. So eventually I will look at it and I will guys let you know, but I can tell you up front, I have some concerns but it's really cool stuff and there is more more to come with technology i will argue in fact uh, even though it's here not necessarily on the slide the most important device when it comes down to marketing in the last few years is this guy right here right you have a smartphone that is tracking all the information of everything that you're doing right so if you're a company like google or amazon you know so much about customers because of this guy right you know a lot about them and uh, you know where they are going you know what they are buying you know what they are browsing and uh, using cookies to track people etc etc there is lots of behavioral data that you can use using all these sensors to know what people are doing what they are interested in and try to improve your marketing based on that so after we know what techniques and tools we're going to use we have a uh, research methodology that we're going to be following and we know exactly who it is that we're going to be asking what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and collect the information from them right using either the questionnaire or any of these technologies that we were talking about right it could be observation where you sit and see what people do and uh, whenever i was teaching market research i will have students do that right and although now with all these social distancing it may, it's a little bit more problematic right uh, but you just collect information and information it could be text it could be video uh, if you are using technology like video cameras to see what consumers are doing um, it could be answers to numerical questions if you have close-ended questions for example so you're going to collect that information then what you're going to do is first you're going to clean the data make sure that people are actually answering for example if it's a survey meaningfully so you might have uh, ways of checking whether people I was just answering 7777 to everything without reading the questions, which happens. So you might have to have some ways of checking this. A typical way of checking this is to have one or two questions that are asking about the same thing, and one is reverse coded. And what do I mean by reverse coded? So, for example, I love brand X, and then the next question is, I hate brand x so it's the same brand if people are answering seven and seven in both it's probably because they are not reading the question okay so you have some checks to make sure that you know those people are paying attention and providing meaningful information and if they're not you're better off not using their data because it's going to clutter and confuse things okay so you're going to process the information right which might do, mean doing some cleaning like i've said maybe data imputing right so if you have a online data like if you have an online questionnaire that data is going to directly be stored already into a, a computer file like maybe in excel or some other uh, database um, format but if you are receiving questionnaires uh, via mail right so now you're going to have to open all those questionnaires and then input all that data into a computer right you're going to have to do some cleaning and organizing after that you're going to have to analyze the information like i think i mentioned before the type of analysis that you're going to do is going to be heavily dependent on what kind of research methodology you're using uh, for the most part in survey research what we're going to be doing is a lot of uh, summaries of data so you're going to use things like means to just describe how the average person is doing this that the other if you are doing segmentation you might do some cluster analysis and uh, which is a technique that enables you to put people into groups okay which is what segments are we talk more about this when we talk about segmentation okay on the other hand if you are doing a, a causal relation a relationship so if you are doing an experiment uh, you might actually be doing checking differences between groups right so to one group you will show them a commercial to another one you won't show them the commercial and what you will do is you will look at the difference in attitude between the two of them towards the brand that it's advertised right to see if it actually is working right and to do that you're going to use specific uh, statistical techniques for example in the case that i just described you will use something called anova you don't need to know any of this by the way and um, but if you were to do anything like marketing research you will have to have a good solid base 
uh, in quantitative uh, analysis, um, which you might already be getting. I hope you're taking at least a couple of stats classes. But if you're not, and if you're interested in marketing research, I will strongly uh, encourage you to take a few stats classes. Because, and when I say stats, it could be econometrics. Um, it's equally useful. And that's taught actually at the business school, right? Uh, and the reason why you take those classes is so that you can analyze the data. So you can look at the data and draw some conclusions from it, right? Maybe generalize to the population, like I was saying before, okay? Then you're going to do some interpretation of the findings. Now, in the case of interpreting, I will argue that you need somebody who is technically competent and somebody who is managerially competent as well, okay? So don't just give the data to a statistician and ask them, what it is that it's on the data because you probably won't come up with an interesting story out of that, at least not in my experience, okay? What it's useful is you have a team of two. A experienced manager that knows exactly what's happening in the industry already, really understand the ins and outs of the industry, and the technically competent statistician. And when I say statistician, it could be a marketing guy too, but that knows about statistics, right? And between the two of them, they're gonna put together a story based on the data that hopefully is gonna make sense. Okay, it needs to cross the threshold of common sense. If it doesn't make sense, there's probably some flaw in there, okay? So this is why you need a manager looking at it and trying to make sense of the data, not just a technical person. Then draw some conclusions, and then based on these conclusions, suggest courses of action that will help with the situation, right? So if you're deciding whether to launch a product or not, make a recommendation based on the data whether the product should be launched or not, right? If you're trying to identify the reasons why something's not happening, then propose a list of potential reasons why not, and then report this to management, usually in presentation form. And you will write a report, but in my experience, most people don't read reports, especially if they are long and technical. So you need to break this down to a level where somebody who is not technically competent can understand. This cannot be a bunch of statistical mumbo jumbo. Okay, you need to break it down. Uh, and in my experience, you need to cross the grandma test. What is the grandma test? If you cannot explain it to your grandma, you don't understand it properly and you're not probably qualified to give that uh, presentation. So you need to break it down to a point where somebody who is not technically competent competent can make an assessment as to whether it makes sense or not. Okay, now uh, one aspect uh, that has been used quite heavily in the last 20 years, and now it's kind of changing a little bit in terms of names, but is this idea of customer relationship management. So if you remember, we were talking about marketing as creating value for the customer and hence looking at it long term and try to engage the customer in some sort of relationship. Well, customer relationship management is the field uh, that tries to marry this information that you're gathering with this need to create value and create a relationship with the customer. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to gather as much information as possible that is going to help you manage this relationship with your customer over time. And how you're going to do that is by just making wise decisions at the different points by gathering the best information that you can get to make sure that you can create that value for your customer. So the way you do this is by instead of gathering information, every once in a while gathering information in all touch points with the customer, right? From purchases, which is obvious, you're probably gonna be doing this, right? To other things like any time that they contact a salesperson, right? So for example, when you go and test drive a car, Oftentimes what they will do is they will, even if you don't buy the car, they will just call you and they will just ask you questions, right? They're trying to find out why it is that you're moving forward in the process and you're going to maybe buy the car or not, right? So Salesforce contact, right? It could be if you need some service or support, right? When you call customer service, almost every time you'll get the message that tells you that, you know, this information can actually be used for training purposes and it's gonna be recorded, right? And not only they use it for training purposes, but they will also gather that information to make sure that they know how it is that the relationship is going with you, right? And so it can be used also for evaluation purposes, not only for training purposes, right? Anytime you visit a website, right? This is why a lot of websites will ask you to log in, right? They want to have a record of who you are and why it is that you are actually visiting the website. Are you just browsing, 
right? And they will put some cookie in your computer that will track you. Or uh, are you there to buy a product or are you there to gather information, right? Surveys, satisfaction is post-purchase usually, right? How happy are you with, um, with the service that you're providing? And the idea of customer relationship management is using all this data to try to maximize the chances that the customer will stay with us and continue buying our product and maybe increasing our share of their wallet if possible. And finally, after you actually have drawn all your conclusions, you have uh, created that presentation maybe for, for management, if it's a particular uh, project, or if you have created a database, for example, that maybe your salespeople can have access to, the way you're going to distribute that uh, information is going to vary by company, right? For the most part, you're going to have that information in an intranet that it's only available to the people that work for the organization. But one thing that we see more and more is where uh, the organizations are sharing information, especially with their partners. So let me give you an example. Uh, you have Procter & Gamble, which is one of the largest consumer packaged goods manufacturers in the world. They make products like Tide or Gillette that you probably know, many others. And so what they will do, for example, is they will share a lot of their information with Walmart, right? And Walmart shares a lot of their information with them. And the reason why they do this is because they want to have a good guess, for example, in how to best manage the inventory. They want to make sure that the stores are not running out of the product because every time that a customer goes and Tide is not on the shelf, they're going to buy something else, right? So to minimize the chances that that happens, and also to make sure that you don't have to have too much product because that's expensive. You need to pay for shelf space, etc. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to share a lot of the information about, for example, orders between the two of them. In fact, in the case of Procter & Gamble and Walmart, uh, Procter & Gamble uh, is the one that is going to be doing a lot of the decisions about inventory for uh, Walmart. And the reason why is because they share a lot of this information so tightly between the two of them that Walmart delegates some of the decision-making to Procter & Gamble. But that's kind of an extreme case of this information sharing that I was talking about. And I think that's as much as I want to talk about.